the film board, and we uh, with movies we like, and it's me, Pete Wright, and I'm here with Andy Nelson. Hello, Andy. Hello, everybody. Yeah, there's so much for our film board. <laughs> it's dwindling. Uh, we we sort of uh, we sort of uh, derailed this week on our movie watching schedule. Tonight's film is uh, the fantastic, uh, fantastic Looper uh, by the uh, the fantastic Ryan uh, Johnson, right? That's the one. I hope we're talking about the same movie. Yes, we're not talking about. Uh, uh, I can't think of anything else. Jumper. We, or... we uh, <laughs> jumper. I would. <laughs> I'm not going to say I would rather talk about jumper. Okay. Uh, I. Uh, but I. I do. Uh, I, I do want to say that I. We are missing our other. Uh, our, our fair friends. Um, uh, Chad, Steve Sarmento, Mike Evans, they could not make it tonight. Chad's actually in the movie right now, and he may he may join us uh, shortly uh, if he can uh, get out and, and call in. So uh, we'll see. But we have decided to go on with the show and talk a little bit about this movie uh, and uh, and share our thoughts. Andy, I'm, I, we, we haven't talked about it yet. Uh, I'm, I'm desperately interested. What did you think of this film? I really enjoyed Looper. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it it lulled a little bit in the middle, but on the whole, it was, I think, a smart science fiction film and a really uh, interesting story that really kept me engrossed through the whole thing, particularly the build-up toward the uh, climax at the end, which was just very exciting to see. So I really liked it. Okay. I I thought there were some really clever things going on in this movie. And I, I want to talk about the time travel stuff and, and get your thoughts on how they handled, specifically how they handled that and, uh, you know, how they handled what I'll call the diner cop-out scene uh, where they expressly didn't handle the time travel stuff. It was, yeah, I, I found that sort of really interesting context shift. Um but uh, I went in. I think I think this was a movie that suffered from huge expectations for me. I was a mm-hmm. huge, huge fan of uh, Brick and and um, the Brothers Bloom, uh, Ryan Johnson's previous uh, big films, and uh, it, particularly Brick. I thought was just m- masterfully done. Uh, you know, shoehorning a, a noir. Uh, styled uh, film into an all-American high school. I thought was really a a great. Uh, it, it was a great mix, and so I went in thinking, "Well, this is great. Let's apply that that wonderful sort of cleverness to um, to this, and we'll have another Inception." Which I, you know, I think you know, I I really loved Inception. Uh, I thought it was just fantastic, and I needed Looper to be Inception for for me for time travel, and and Inception it was not. It, it, right. um, it you know, I felt like it lulled in. All the wrong places. Like some of the some of the reviews have said, uh, you know, this was a movie that's not afraid to slow down, and I I uh, I would disagree with that. I mean, I think it's um, uh, it's a movie that maybe should have been uh, more afraid of slowing down than maybe. They were. <laughs> I don't think. I mean, it definitely slowed down, and I I do think that caused some of those lulls in the in the second act for me that really. Um, yeah, it felt like it was going on a little longer than it needed to in that second act. Um, I felt everything there was essential, though. So, I mean, that's it's it's kind of that tricky game of how do you keep all that information in and and um, make it feel fast paced still. And I, I don't know. I, I I really I think I forgave forgave it for some of that the lulls in the second act because I really liked everything at the end. I really liked how it built toward that final, uh, the final moment there. Okay, so structurally, the way the film was put together, we we start with, and this is the spoiler territory. Um, yeah, I guess we should let everybody yeah. know that the, these Google Hangouts that we do generally are are, are full of spoilers. So watch the yeah. movie first. And this is since this is such a new movie, don't uh, yeah, uh, big spoilers. So we, yeah. we we kick off the movie and we we learn about the 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 mythology of the Looper, and we're already this is a movie that is set in the future and the extra future. <laughs> in multiple Could you call future. it the the super future? So a future prime. Uh, future Alpha, Future Beta. <laughs> there you go. 
and uh, and the looper the whole concept of the looper is a looper is this uh, is this assassin that lives at one point in time and the mob sends bad or, or sends people <laughs> bad guys worse guys guys they want uh, you know rubbed out of history back in time the looper kills them disposes of the body because they never and then they never exist from that point forward and uh, and so that's the that's the the mythology of the looper, and it's very clever. I think that's a, I think that's fantastic. I, uh, I really like that conceit. I I really liked the 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 whole myth around closing the loop. I thought that was fantastic. You're working for the mob. They're they're you know bad people already when when they're finished uh, with the uh, you know the the services of this particular looper. They close the loop, meaning they send that the looper's older self back in time uh, and so that the looper can assassinate himself. And then essentially retire. And retire. And, they, and he point. comes back with, with all the money, uh, gold bricks on his back, and, uh, you know, the, and, and so that's the big payout. So um, he has 30 years to live out the rest of his days in, in plenty. Right. So that's great, right? That's great. So far, I'm, I'm excited about this film. Okay. And then they introduce this concept of the Rainmaker. Mm -hmm. You liked the Rainmaker? I didn't have a problem with the Rainmaker. I mean, it, it, the title itself I, I thought was a little silly, but on the whole, it, it's, it's just... Hello, Yen. Hi. I'm here, I'm here <laughs> twice. Apparently. So, uh, are we still recording, or uh, because you yes. dropped out? Did you? No, no, no. We're still, uh, we're still recording. Apparently. Because <laughs> I see two of you down there now. I'm yeah, really no, confused. I'm, I'm looking forward to see how that works. I'm going to try and. <laughs> I, I don't know if. Uh, who knows? Okay, so am I still? Uh, okay, yeah. I'll just assume that we're still. We were talking about the. Uh, so the rainmaker. rainmaker. It's. I don't like the name the rainmaker. It's kind of lame. Um. I don't have a problem with the concept of it. I, I, I mean, I think it's interesting. It's like any other gang boss taking over rival gang territory, you know, except the mythology of this one is he takes over um, all of the major... Joseph Gordon-Levitt makes that point. He's like, how did he do that? You know, you'd have to have an army to do that. He's like, he didn't have an army. and um, But he did it, and nobody could figure out how. And But this guy somehow managed to get on top of everybody. And so he's the guy now that that the future Joe, played by Bruce Willis, wants to come back and assassinate to to get rid of all of this turmoil in the future so that he can be with his wife still. Okay. Because it, because what we see at, at one of these uh, in, in one of these loops is uh, the wife being uh, assassinated or killed accidentally, I assume, uh, by you know the thugs. Right, right. By the rainmakers, thugs who have yeah. who have come to take Bruce Willis back. So you know they're to close the loop. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So that's the that's the that's the mythology. Yes. Okay. So now, as with these movies, you, you know, with Memento, with Memento, with Primer, with you know, any of these the sort of contemporary time travel movies, we have the the funky cutting. Uh, how do you piece together this film? Because there was the there there was the the initial uh, slice, and then we have the. We have the first slice where he, where Joseph Gordon Levitt, Levitt, uh, I like to call him Jason, uh, falls <laughs> off the falls off the building, right? Right. He falls off the building and then lands on and blacks out, mm -hmm. right? And then we go back and see that whole thing again, right? And that starts with him failing to kill his to close his loop, right? So make sense of that for me. I dare you. The, the way that it jumps from one to the next? Because mm -hmm. okay. one of them he fails. Right. And then we get to see that again. Right. Where he doesn't fail and he kills his he kills his future self. He closes his loop. Okay, that's that's what happens. That's the that's the element that happens essentially 
in order for him to have somebody to close, right? Right. So his future self goes off into the future. Uh, no, sorry, Joseph Gordon-Levitt goes off into the future and then and comes back and, and he kills him. And that's, that's how Joseph Gordon-Levitt gets to go you know, off and make all this money and become a crime lord and then fall in love with this woman and change his ways only to be sent back. And so we're seeing the whole thing twice, but it's kind of memento style. Because we get to see it from each perspective. Yeah, the first time really is him killing his future self, right? That's really what happens the first time. Right. And then when he makes it 30 years in the future and he comes back, now he's realized he's fallen in love with this woman. He comes back and he... He takes charge, but we see that one play out in the film first. So, and so th when he comes back, Bruce Willis knocks out Joseph Gordon-Levitt and runs away. Okay, so so the way I the way I'm sort of con conceptualizing is the first time we get to see it from from uh, JGL's perspective, right, younger Joe, <laughs> and then we get to see it from older Joe as he has gotten older. Right. Right, so we get to we get to see the movie from two different perspectives, two different Joe perspectives. Right, right. It's very you know, anytime you're doing a movie about time travel, the whole concept of time travel paradox always throws everything off. I mean, there's no way anything really makes sense, right? Because even if he did successfully kill, and I'm stepping way ahead of our conversation here, no, go ahead. but even if he did successfully kill the Rainmaker in the past, when the Rainmaker is just a child, that would potentially throw everything off for the rest of his life, and he would never, probably never even meet his future wife. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, but that's the nature. You're going to run into that problem in any time travel movie. And so that's, by default, I guess it becomes the nature of trying to make a time travel movie that makes sense. Right. That's what you have to let go of if you're if, watching if, these movies. Yeah, if you dig deep into a time travel movie, it'll never work. Well, and that's my thing. I mean, I, I'm not one of those people that digs deep into time travel movies. Like, if it... Because if it, you I, can't enjoy them otherwise. Yeah, exactly. I don't... I don't... There, I know there are people who do. I have dear friends who do. They get it, they make sense of it, and they do diagrams with straws, <laughs> which is one of the reasons I thought that was such a that was the, yeah. the diner cop out moment was so great. This is when we have uh, younger Joe and older Joe meeting and right. sitting still together for the first time, mm -hmm. which and and I thought that was important for a number of reasons. First of all, it lets them have this conversation about you know we're not going to try and make sense of the time travel because if we did try it would it would fry your brain. Right. But second, because we get to see how they look together. Mm -hmm. That's been a point of much discussion. I'm curious if you think it paid off. Uh, this is the prosthetic eyebrows and nose that they put on to... Uh, JGL. JGL. I liked it. I never had a problem with it. I liked the look on him. And I thought, aside from the look, and actually I, I haven't heard it specifically be nose and eyebrows. I've heard that there's just prosthetics they haven't come out to acknowledge what it is they're trying to not acknowledge. They're trying to, you know, let the illusion live hmm. without revealing this and this and this cheekbone and that ear or whatever it is, you know. But anyway, um, I really liked it. And aside from the look, I, I thought that JGL did a really good job of studying Bruce Willis because he he had so many Bruce Willis mannerisms, like the way that he would just kind of look and and turn, you know, and, and just a lot of those sorts of things throughout the film that I really did. I I bought it. I bought that he was a younger version of him. The prosthetics never bothered me. I it was it was in and out. It was like coming in and out of focus for me. Like I found myself looking at him and and really noting that his the the upper half of his face looked like plastic. Um, or, but then, then you would have these scenes where you would see him lying down on his bed, right? He would be, or, or on the ground or whatever, he'd be knocked down somewhere. And, and he would like grit his teeth. And I found the, the teeth grinding particularly notable because you would see these, the, the musculature 
under the skin, right, right around here, right. start to flex. You know, you yeah. would see the the character of the face start to flex, which I thought was really interesting because generally you didn't notice that. Generally, his you know his eyebrows were always just a little too high and his forehead a little too plastic and straight. To to and I I found myself really, uh, I, I'm sure it's because I just. I went in knowing it, and I so all I could do is is focus on it. I was just hyper focused on it, and it was well. It's, I found myself it's, really distracted. It's one of those things. Like, I think the first time in, it's always a little harder anyway. Like watching Orson Welles in A Touch of Evil, or even when we saw him in Compulsion. Orson Welles was notorious for always putting on a different nose for different performances because he felt that it helped him transform into the different characters. And I I think I. I'd have to go back and look at his performances, but I think in a lot of them he ended up having some sort of a, like a prosthetic nose or just a little addition to to it. And I, it's one of those things that I always notice like the first time, but then I just kind of like get past it and just accept it as it is. And and then the more I watch the film, I, I stop even noticing it, you know, and I just start accepting that's how Orson Welles looks and that's how this character looks. And I think that's how it is with um, JGL and this one. I, I kind of got to a point where I'm just like, oh, yeah, that's him. And it's just like I wasn't even paying attention to it anymore. I mean, there were a couple shots, I guess I would say. Um, there was one shot where I did notice. I'm like, well, that's odd that the the way they did the bridge of his nose, it's like a little wider above his nose. And then it actually narrows down. And, like, that was something that I noticed. But it didn't, like, pull me out of it or anything. So... It's one of those things where I, I don't put a whole lot of stock into it. I just like the way that it actually creates a different look for a person. So, Yeah, I, you know, the more I, I find myself thinking about it, the more I think about, you know, how is this any different than what they do to Daniel Day-Lewis in, in Lincoln? Yeah, right, right. You know, slapping beards and things all over his face, you know. I mean, it's just, it's a character thing. I guess my problem with it was that, I you know, I... I I don't see the resemblance between younger Joe and older Joe. I don't. I, I look at Bruce Willis side by side with <clears throat> with now epoxied uh, Gordon Levitt, and I I I just don't see it. Uh, and and that I found really kind of frustrating because I I guess maybe my my. Um, my frustration is that I wanted it to be a more powerful thing because I think yeah. Gordon Levitt is a is a fine looking lad and a, a good enough actor to be able to pull off. Like you said, I mean, it felt like he really did study Bruce Willis and the mannerisms, and I'm not sure I needed the prosthetics. I felt that was a bridge too far, and and it, it was you know why were we why did we go that far when we have two actors who can certainly play um, play this this type of character twist. So you you um, would have been fine if they just had JGL without the prosthetics. Yeah, yeah. And then Bruce Willis as the grown-up version. I, I here's the thing that I like about it though is that they 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 tried it because oftentimes you'll cast two people as the younger and the older versions of somebody. And there are times where I'm like like uh, like Big Fish, which we just talked about, Alison Lohman and Jessica Lang. I swear they probably have time traveled through time because they do look identical. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's. It, uncanny how much they resemble each other. Mm -hmm. But then there are movies, and I can't think of any right now, where you have somebody who's a young version and an old version, and you're like, why would they have cast those two people to be this? You know, they just don't look anything alike. Yeah. And it's mind-boggling that, um, that they pick people, but because it's a movie, you just kind of buy into it. Okay, it's a movie. I'll, that's going to be the older version of that person. And so, you know, say la vie. I'll just, I'll just buy into it. Um, and one way or the other, you have to cast it that way, unless you're going to do it like a, a Benjamin Button type of thing, which is obviously has its own challenges. But the thing that I liked about it is that they tried it, and they, they did something to his face because they, they really wanted to, to, uh, to go that extra mile to give us that um, possibility that they would be connected. And, I, you know, I, I like that. It's, um, I thought it was a, a, a bold choice for sure because anytime you're putting – very subtle prosthetics like that on a person, it's, I mean, you're, you are begging for people to notice it, you know? Yeah, begging is right. Um, it, they, they made just, just a big enough deal out of it that, that, um, 
you know, it, it became a sort of a central issue in the in the the pre run of the film. Yeah. yeah. And that's I think the thing that makes me bitter. Like I said, I think he could have pulled this off without it. I, I guess you know, you, you've sort of just painted me as the guy who says they shouldn't take risks in movies <laughs> like this. And I don't like being on that side. Of the I'm glad they tried it too. In that I mean, I really am. And, and I guess what I'm saying is maybe they should have gone full Benjamin Button and, and just, you know, CGI the hell out of the guy. Uh, it, it'd be, you know, and just actually put Bruce Willis's head like they did, you know, with uh, 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 Tron right. Legacy. Oh yeah, Jeff, Dan, you know, Jeff Bridges. Jeff Bridges, but uh, that was that, that was just not, didn't look right. Not great. That, that, see, <laughs> see, what would you rather have? That didn't look good to me. Like the Jeff Bridges, the young computer Jeff Bridges, like yeah. always looked like a computerized version of him, yeah. and I, it just didn't work for me. Benjamin Button, that really worked. Um, I can only imagine how challenging that would be to do. Um, this much of though, because even when you do have that teenage Brad Pitt, where they, you know, I can't remember what the process they named it, but where they youngify him, yeah, that was only one scene of the film, and I can only imagine how challenging it is to really create that, like consistently through an entire film. Right. Yeah. No. I. You know. I think to your. I, I mean. I think you got to. You. You certainly have the point. I you know I can let that go, but it still doesn't change the fact that his eyebrows were way too high. Uh, see, I never even noticed his eyebrows. <laughs> like I, I I noticed that they Did were. Did you see the movie? Did all you really I, go? Yeah. <laughs> Did you just watch the trailer seventy times? No, all I all I noticed with his eyebrows is that they were much. I thought they were much darker than I'd ever noticed for Joseph Gordon-Levitt. Like they they really made them look a lot darker and just. A little thicker looking, but I never okay, noticed them being higher. I'm gonna be. I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna. I'm, this is gonna be subtle. So you just tell me if you notice. <laughs> Very subtle. Very subtle. Look at my smoky eyes. I'm JGL. All I can see is your the bridge of your nose looks a little different. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I just don't notice. Oh, I just don't, I don't notice. I I really think that the eyebrow thing is is not. I like. I didn't notice anything with his eyebrows. So I think that you're you're making mountain out of a molehill. <laughs> you're a molehill. <laughs> All right. So uh, what was the next the next point that I uh, had to make on this film? Uh, we talked about uh, a little bit. Of, I want to. I'm getting to my to my central reaction here. We talked oh, about the time travel. Oh, wow, well, this is crazy, a good build-up. All right. Crazy, crazy eyeball makeup, <laughs> or eyebrow makeup. Eyeball. Those eyeball eyeballs were crazy. On on Jason's face. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we get to uh, the Rainmaker, the kid, the whole premise of Bruce Willis uh, is deciding to go kill children because he wants to be with his wife uh, in the future. That's, that's, I mean, you know, I... I I guess I, I sort of bought that uh, a little bit. I mean, I guess when you're when you, that's that was the emotional sort of connection, and I, and that's one of the elements I really liked in the movie was that uh, young Joe and old Joe ended up fighting for what was what ended up being the same thing, uh, the same sort of emotional piece um, that manifested in very different ways, and. Uh, um, and and I liked that that build up. I it, I think that's what's so frustrating about this whole movie is that it was a it was just a big near miss to me. Hmm. Yeah, it was like a movie that just didn't execute. Um, I, I just didn't find myself totally into it. It was no what's in the box kind of a moment. I wanted well, there to be a what's in the box man. Yeah. Really what's in the box moment. I wanted that level of oh my god. Yeah. Yeah, and when he realized, when he finally makes that connection and says, and, and I thought this was a great beat, this was a great moment when he says, you know, I realized that I saw it all play out, and I realized yeah. that this never ends and how we got here, and I needed to change it. Mm -hmm. All the sound stops. He turns the thing back on his own heart and pulls the trigger. That was a really powerful moment. Yeah. And then we just get old Joe just disappears. And I... What? What should he have done? I don't know. I don't know what he should have done. I didn't make the movie. I just get to armchair it. He killed his future self. 
I know he, he erased himself. himself. Right. So how would he? Have he a- erased himself from history, and I just didn't. I I felt like it didn't. It it didn't quite earn the 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 powerhouse reaction that I really wanted to have. Well, but it made sense to you though. Yeah. Okay. As long as it, it almost made, made it almost made it too much sense to me. That may be the problem is that I felt like it, it like you want to talk about taking risks. Uh, like I had to see Inception three times to get it. You oh. know, I had to see Primer seventeen times to get it. <laughs> like those were movies that were smaller in well, not Inception, but but Primer in particular is a movie that executed so well on such a uh, on a conceptual level um, that uh, you know it was. I, I, it was just it, fantastic. It didn't need any of the uh, glitz and glamour of, uh, of uh, you know, the the blockbuster treatment because it. I, I felt like it dealt with, you know, the subtleties of this of their concept of time travel so well, and I, it hurt my head in a way that made me love more. <laughs> Do you know Very what I mean? True. Like this oh, movie was like, ah, oh, come on. I I didn't think that with this. Uh, there were a couple things with this movie that I was like, oh, well, I, I don't know about that. Uh, I don't buy that. You know, there are a couple things. What but... didn't you buy? Go ahead, give me your list of a couple. No, things. they're 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 nothing. They're nothing big, but I just thought the the floating motorcycles were kind of silly. Why were there floating motorcycles? Totally with you on that. Yeah, there was. They made no big deal about future tech. They pay each other in gold and silver bars for crying out loud. <laughs> And they had flying motorcycles. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't like the flying motorcycles. I also, the scene where the, um, I have to look on IMDb real quick because I can't remember his name. The character who's um, the the um, Gatling, or no, the Gat, is that what kid, they call those yeah, guys? Kid, kid uh, Blue. Kid Blue, Noah Segan, mm-hmm. um, has been kind of... Um, Kicked out of the group by Jeff Daniels, who heads up the Gats in the in the JGL period of time um, for screwing things up way too many times, and he decides he's gonna he's gonna fix this and he's gonna track down the future uh, Joe Bruce Willis on his own, and he goes to this um, whore's house, this prostitute played by Piper Parabo, um, and he sees Bruce Willis kind of stalking her basically although we know why Bruce Willis is there which is because her kid happens to be one of these three kids that may be the kid who grows up and turns into Rainmaker what are the odds what are the odds oh I I know I know but that's not my point but that that is what that is pretty a, a little crazy but the other thing is, then when Bruce Willis finally breaks into the house to go kill the kid, which is a different time. I don't know why he just doesn't do it when he's there. He, like, stalks her, and then he leaves, and then he comes back. It happens to be, A, when this guy, uh, Kid Blue, is there waiting for Bruce Willis to come in, right? And Sitting B, in the dark. Well, and B, sitting in the dark in the kid's room. This guy has no idea that Bruce Willis is trying to kill the kid. He thinks he's trying to hook up with the girl again. I mean, that's what he says. He's like, oh, I, I tracked her down. I, I knew that he was really hot on this one lady back then, and so I, I, I tracked her down. I was watching her, and I saw that he was going to come over to her place or whatever he said. And, and But he's conveniently hiding in the dark in the kid's room as if he knows Bruce Willis is going to go in and try to kill the kid. That I completely didn't buy. I was like, oh, come on. Nope. That, was just yeah. totally, that was totally set up. Um, incorrectly. Yeah, the so. kid in general, as uh, Kid Blue, as the dupe. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, it was not good. Was he? I got to look because I, I was like, I, I wasn't that impressed with him, and it, and his whole character, the way that he kept coming back, he was shot and he was alive, and then he's chasing him on a, on that little floating motorbike and and all that sort of uh, brick. See, so was like, I know that he had to have some tie with. Ryan Johnson to have been in this because I, I wasn't that impressed with him, but yeah, he was in Brick back in '05. Um, and yeah, and wasn't was the 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 other Looper Seth uh, wasn't he in Brick as well? Um, you mean uh, Paul Dano? Yeah, I don't know. Was he? Well, Paul Dano has sure been in a lot. Let he's me. He's been in a lot. 
Uh, he is a popular guy. Um, I don't think so. No, he wasn't huh. in Rick. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Well, there you yeah, have it. I didn't think he was. So, uh, okay. So, I mean, there's a lot, but that and then that final fight with with Kid Blue on the motorbike, and you know, and JGL kind of holds the gun up, and you know, I was like, ugh, all of that stuff just got so silly with with that guy. It's just like, just you know, he should have been dead already. I yeah. didn't like him. Yeah. Um, I did really like the scene when Bruce Willis was brought in though, and escapes and and gets out and slaughters everybody and. Including Jeff Daniels, and and um, I kind of liked how they shot that scene. How we don't see the uh, we don't see that whole fight happen. I thought that was pretty nice. Oh, but the the sort of climax of the fight, we see him as he's slaughtering all the the gats. But yeah. right after when they kick over the table and Abe, mm-hmm. they hand to Abe a gun, and the next thing we see is they're all dead. The next thing we see after is the what's door his name? opens. Well, the next thing we see is what's his, yeah the door opens, and then we. Then we open up on that guy's eye, on Kid Blue's eye, as he comes to yeah. after being shot. Ugh. Yeah, that was a nice. No, yeah, but that was gotcha. nice. I just didn't like Kid Blue waking, but yeah, um, that was nice. So those are those are the, really the things that um, that I had problems with, and it, it's not a lot. I mean, for the most part, I did really enjoy it. I did notice this is something else that I thought was <laughs> I, I had a hard time buying into the convenience of it when um, you talked about the scene already when it's the two Joes sitting in the diner talking to each other and they're having that confront that conversation which turns into a little bit more uh, confrontational and Bruce Willis raises his voice you don't know anything blah 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 and, and they start yelling back and forth and I was like god I mean what are all the other patrons saying about this and then we conveniently pull back and see that and the whole diner there are no patrons yeah because those guys are there but I was just like wouldn't they have noticed that, like, as soon as they started yelling at each other, or right. even before that? And you know, it's, that's one of those. I mean, there's a lot of little things like that in this film that I'm just like, okay, I don't quite buy into the convenience of that happening at that particular moment or happening that way. But okay, so I want to go back to the Rainmaker bit, and now that because because I think we've 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 circled around it, and my I think my central challenge with the kid. Mm-hmm. And and the whole TK bit, yeah. you know that they they kept talking about this telekinesis is this new. Now we we also have to we also have X Men, is really what we're saying. <laughs> uh, and everybody is an X-Men. but all they can yeah. really do is float Just quarters, float quarters, and 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 uh, I, I you know I, I uh, but but that gets to the central sort of you you sort of have to set that up I guess somehow in order to set up the fact that this kid is now a uh, super TK, mm-hmm. and he's got to learn how to control that because he is going to become the rainmaker, and he'll be able to move things around and kill people, um, and and take over the entire crime syndicate of the future. So, yeah. uh, did you need that? Did you need that? Uh, the mysticism around the force in this film. Hmm. I mean, that's a good question. I uh, could you have done this film with just the whole concept of closing the loops? This loop doesn't want to get closed, and and then dealing with everything from there. I mean, look, it's so possible. Yeah, the Terminator did it. Yeah, you know, the Terminator did it. I've 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 seen this movie. He tried to kill <laughs> Sarah Connor all over the place, and now he's killing uh-huh. kids, right? Yes. He didn't Sarah Connor didn't have any any special TK. She couldn't float quarters. Yeah, I mean the whole notion of it uh I guess isn't really necessary. And and you what I uh, because look at it. The whole film is a little bit it is like it's it's on the grittier side of the spectrum, right? It's yeah, it's kind yeah. of a dirty natural and there are things in this film that are in direct conflict with the with this sort of aesthetic that has been set up in the film. And that's the thing that I find uh jarring, I think, is that we have the flying motorcycles uh next to the the you know hand revolvers mm-hmm. and we have this we have I, I mean when you look at the 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 
time travel machine itself looks like uh, you know Nemo's bathysphere. I mean, it's like it's total <laughs> full on steampunk awesome, and and yet well, um, right. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I, 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 I use the maybe I use the word awesome and you know, uh, yeah. I thought I I was like gosh I mean is, this is just like you know Bruce Willis taking a trip back through Twelve Monkeys again yeah yeah is yeah, that yeah all I could think about yeah okay so <laughs> I mean it didn't have that that accordion squish yeah. or anything but. <laughs> but but you see my point like like there is this and then we introduce this weird sort of mysticism uh, uh, um, you know and genetic aug augmentation. Mm -hmm. that I felt like we're in conflict and not in a good kind of conflict, not in a, in a, you know, uh, firefly kind of conflict. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, uh, this is a, this is, this is like high jump, low ceiling, not even in a brick kind of conflict where I think that mashup worked for me. This one, uh, it, it ended up just feeling clumsy. And that meant that after the whole farm slowdown, we are just in, oh my God, please, mm -hmm. please, would she shoot somebody else with rock salt? I'm just need <laughs> something <laughs> to happen. Uh, uh, that uh, we pick back up again in this. And, and now the entire third act of the movie is built upon a mysticism that I think is unnecessary and out of context of the film. Hmm. And, and that, I think, was, was the, the a challenge for me to get through. I can see that. I mean, I, I, as you say that, it, I guess it was something that didn't cross my mind, maybe because I just bought into it, and I didn't have any problem feeling that, you know, there's been enough odd genetic mutations over the course of human history from caveman days to now um, you know, like like uh, important things like earlobes and and you know, pre prehensile tails and opposable thumbs and all those important things, right? And then sure, telekinesis. Why throw that into the mix? <laughs> why not? No, I, I mean it's it's it is kind of odd. I don't look at it as kind of a mystical element. I think that's a little far reaching to call it that because then it seems like it's it's calling on some magical force or something like that. But You're just... saying that these weren't midi-chlorians? <laughs> Bite me, man. Uh, this, is, this is a precursor to Star Wars. <laughs> this, right. is, this is the pre-prequel. <laughs> oh, man, that's, uh, that would be pretty funny. No, but I guess I just bought into that whole notion of this as a genetic mutation that does change people in the future and it, you never know i mean it's the sort of thing that that could happen right hey <laughs> as far as i know it's happening right now that's right i i'm floating a quarter right it off could screen be. I am. I am. you know <laughs> your 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 daughter actually looks a lot like Firestarter. I'm not kidding. I can see her get mad one of these days, and uh, as long as my wife doesn't uh, look like Carrie, <laughs> <laughs> then I'm in trouble. And you're in trouble. No, I, right. I okay. The the you're right. I think that the notion of it can very easily be seen as unnecessary. Why do you need to throw that into the mix in order to, to tell this story, which I think it could be completely effective on its own. And I think that's your point, is you could have future Joe jump back, not want to die, have a confrontation with himself. They go on this big, you know, Joe and Joe adventure as they try to sort things out. And <laughs> leave, uh, and, and that's and it, the new name of the film, <laughs> the the Big Joe and Joe the Adventure. Big Joe and Joe Adventure. <laughs> but and it could even be to still kill the crime boss that is causing so much trouble. Does it have to be somebody who has telekinesis and can blow things up? Not just blow I'm things not... up. Turn people inside out in slow motion. Yeah, yeah. That huh? was special. That was special. Hmm. I felt bad for that guy. He was he was one of the best shots there was. <laughs> and and he was a good guy. He was a good guy. I know he was a good guy. Yeah. I I <laughs> actually I love that guy, whatever his name is. is oh that, yeah. yeah. That's Garrett uh Dillahunt, right? Yeah, I don't know his name. But I know him. He was he was in uh uh Sarah Connor Chronicles bringing the whole Terminator thing back in full circle. Talk about talk about a looper, huh? Uh -huh. All right. We're gonna have to close right. that loop. So, so, <laughs> so, so. so uh, get, but you, you I understand your point, and my, I. My agree. point is this: I just have to say this thing. I think after this conversation, 
clearly what has happened is I have a much higher opinion of Bruce Willis, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, and Emily Blunt than Ryan Johnson does. Oh, okay. <laughs> because I think they totally could have pulled off this film in a much more gritty, naturalistic way, and you could have still had the time travel stuff, and it still could have been very cool uh, without and and make it um, you know much more sort of practical. Well, here's here's chase. something to be said to that is I mean this is Ryan Johnson's third film. It's his first big action film. Yeah, and, and first, I love I, Ryan Johnson's work. Let me I just have to say it again. I Yeah. And and I haven't seen Brothers Bloom and honestly I need to see Brick again because I was one of the people who didn't like Brick and that's why I need to watch it again and look at it again. And so it, I guess at this point I I would have to say it's it, this is the Ryan Johnson film that I do like. So I I may like Brick when I see it again. But I don't know. I, I just I guess it's just one of those things. I bought into all of those little things. I bought into the whole notion. See, the the thing for me is like, okay, you don't have to tell this story with the telekinesis. There's there's no reason it has to be a part of it, but it was. He put it in there, and so now we have this story where in the future, whatever it is, twenty forty four is JGL's future, and then I guess it would be twenty seventy four is Bruce Willis's future. Um and telekinesis is just, it has become, from now till then, I guess, it's, it's become something that's there, and people just kind of deal with it, because all it is is really this party trick where people can have this little power where they can, like, levitate quarters and stuff. Clearly, some of that's mutated further. We've got Emily Blunt, who um, has a little more strength, and then her son uh, has a serious power. And um, I, I don't... I, I don't know. I just bought into it, and I really didn't have a problem with it. I never actually even really thought about it much until until you mentioned it. And now that you said that, I'm like, well, you're right. You really didn't need that at all. But it is there, so I guess it's just one of those things now. Okay, it's there. Is there a problem to it being there uh, that makes the film less enjoyable for me? I don't know. I think I'd still enjoy it. Here's the... I, I guess the my, my problem... No, I've already said my problem of it. I'm just going to be saying the same thing over again. Yeah, I mean, I, the yeah. thing is, I'm I really am I I love I love superpowers. I really do. <laughs> uh huh. I love superpowers, and so if I see a movie with superpowers in it, I get pretty fired up. And this is a movie that has superpowers in it. It doesn't really do anything cool with them. Yeah, but see, you're calling it superpowers, and I yeah, think that's I unfair. You bet you're I, I think that's I unfair. Am. Are you calling Carrie, you know, superpowers? Yeah. It's the, the exact yes. same power. Yes, but only because you called my bluff. <laughs> I got uh? you. All right, all right. Uh? That's right. Uh, Let's see how we're this, okay, okay, so, so when so, I, no, 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 no. When I, oh, see, when okay. I see movies like this, I, I think Chronicle, which I deeply enjoyed. Yes. That satisfied deeply. me on many levels. Many of them were quite juvenile. <laughs> okay. Okay. So all of that aside, I yeah. mean, we we have our issues with that. Let's 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 talk about something else. Yeah, 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 yeah. What did you think of uh, Pierce Gagnon playing Sid the kid? Oh God. There are these. There are you run into these kids, right? Mm -hmm. That when yeah. you, you know, it's like I often think to myself, you know, I hear, I hear people that I like say, oh, you know, that that child's an old soul. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't really know what that means, until I see kids like Pierce Gagnon and Haley Joel Osment and yeah, like those, the like at at some point you 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 see those kids and it's like that that kid is in touch with the space of himself that I. Uh, that, that I certainly was not at that age, and I don't know many kids who are. I thought he did an exceptionally good job. He, he floored me, and I have yeah. a real hard time accepting the performances of kid actors, and, and I tend to give them a little leeway because they're kids, even though I never like having to, you know, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. But when I see a kid, a child performance that just feels authentic all the way through, I mean, it really knocks knocks my socks off because I, I so rarely expect that. And this kid, I mean, I kept waiting. I kept waiting for this kid to say a line that felt fake or to give me a, a sign of something that just, that reeked, um, okay, he just he's just saying a line, he doesn't really know what he's saying or something. 
all the way through, this kid just nailed it out of the park. You know, when he, when he, I, he had me uh, at the table when, when he was building the signal and uh, of the frogs. Yeah, right. Because up, up until then, we'd seen him kind of peripherally. He'd been walking around. He'd had a couple of lines. But at the table, when uh, Joe says, um, you know, well, how do you make the signal stronger? And Sid look, looks up, but sort of out of the corner of his eye, and says totally authentically, a bigger battery. Yeah. And, and I just, I was like, that's how it should be. That's exactly it. This yeah. kid, it's it, that's exactly it. That kid is building the signal with a bigger battery. I totally buy it. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. It was amazing. It really was. This kid, I mean, what a find. Uh, is, truly, he's... truly. I couldn't get enough of him. I, yeah. I enjoyed every second of him on screen. And I, I, I mean, honestly, I have a hard time thinking about making films that have horrific things in them when you have a child involved. Yeah. And this kid had some horrific things happening in scenes that he was involved in. I, I mean, my first, my first thought that goes through my head is, if I were that kid's parents, I would never have let, them, let him into this film. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, I mean, that's, it's always a hard line as a filmmaker telling a story where you're, doing, you're putting kids into this sort of position because if it's, if it's in the story, I mean, it's critical to find the right kid. But that means you have to find the right parent who's going to let their kid be in a film like that. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a delicate line to cross, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, and, you know, I was thinking about it. Like, how much of that kid, how much did he witness, right? How much of it was he going to be really involved? Because, you know, well, the scene sure. where he pulls, the, turns the, kid, the guy inside out, that's, that's after, that's after, you know, that's added later. Um, yeah, that's the right. And, and then I then then you think, okay, well, <laughs> all right, Sid, we're gonna put you out in the middle of this cane field and cover you with blood and brain matter, like <laughs> all over your face and eyes. So just sit real still, all right, will you, buddy? Yeah, that's like, the, that's the scene in particular I was thinking about, where he's just drenched in that man's yeah, blood. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure they said we're gonna paint you. Could that paint be fun? We're gonna paint you. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that's how they approached it yeah. with the kid, but yeah, uh, yeah. Um, you know, other than that, I mean, I, I mean, the performance. I think we've mentioned everybody who, who I enjoyed as far as performances: JGL, Bruce Willis, Emily Blunt, Paul Dano, um, I, Jeff Daniels. I mean, I just always yeah. loved Jeff Daniels, and I loved seeing him and JGL in a movie again because I yeah. absolutely loved The Lookout. That was such a great movie. Did you see that one? Uh, I'm looking at. Did I see that one? If not, you should watch that. Wow. Oh, it's the one where JGL had been in an accident and now has to like repeat his um, daily itinerary every day because he doesn't have um, memory. Like he can't retain memories. Yes, this and, was yeah. this was uh, clean <laughs> clean slate, but not funny. <laughs> Right. Less, it, less, yeah, more, more violence, less Dana Carvey. Yeah, you don't have this one under your pillow. No, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, definitely. I, uh, you're right. God, I'd totally forgotten that they were in that. Yeah, great movie. movie together. Um, yes, Jeff Daniels, fantastic. Jeff Daniels is one of those actors that he's pretty tough to, to not like. He's just a likable guy. He is, and he's not... He's kind of dropped out of being leads in films. So what's the last lead he was in a film? Uh, I mean, I guess I'm, so. I guess he's in indie films. There's there's indie films that he pops into now and then, but well, uh, I mean, because he's it, it, it's hard to to say because you know what do you what do you do with the newsroom? Well, I'm not counting TV. I'm counting just his films. But... I wonder if he would count TV. Hmm. Mm, yeah, I just got I just got. To... I just got told, didn't I? You did. You just got mm -hmm. told. Yeah. Space, space chimps. Um, <laughs> all right. So anyhow, I, I think you're right. He's a, a, a very talented fellow. Um, that's right. That was live on the air. <laughs> that just happened. <laughs> that was awesome. Unbelievable. This is a <laughs> this is a professional operation. <laughs> this is on this is on the YouTube. Awesome, love it. Yeah. So, uh, what do we want to talk about? 
no, no, no. I mean, I, I, you know, I feel like this. My, uh, you heard my opinion of the movie. I think this yeah. was a this was a near miss, and it was a uh, it was a tough film for for me to watch on that level because there's so much I liked about it, and there was so much I felt like was, um, you know, was just so close to to being the film that I wanted it to be when I walked in. Yeah. And, yeah. and it just didn't hit that mark for me. And I, and I mean, it's not a movie that I, I need to rush out and see again because it's, it was that powerful. Uh, I didn't feel like the, the, um, when I see, uh, a, a time travel movie, I feel like I want to be tested and I'm kind of simple when it comes to this stuff. And so mm-hmm. I, it doesn't take much to test me. And so when I can make sense of it on a first viewing, I feel like, eh, well. Okay, wait, wait, wait. There were a couple of things that I felt like we, we need to talk about that I thought were enormously clever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, 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 the arm thing, the tattoo. That, I was, I was going to actually just bring that up because I, yeah. I, I wanted to comment how, how much I liked that as a scene. When we see Seth, Paul Dano's character, who is the first looper who doesn't close his loop. Yeah. Uh, when we see his future self escaping, and we see those, the uh, the scars appear on his arm. Yeah, the be, be and, here in fifteen minutes, and then his fingers start disappearing, and his his it, when he puts his foot on the brake, his foot is gone, and yeah, and when you come to that as an audience, remember the audience when you come to the realization that right now younger Seth is being dismantled, mm-hmm. dismembered, dismantled. Mm-hmm. I will say they sure didn't give him 15 minutes to get there before they started hacking him up. Yeah, it's like right after the scar appeared, his finger disappeared, and then his other finger disappeared. I'm like, aren't they going to give him like? I mean, how's he going to get there? <laughs> like, Jeez, he's slow crawling, down, guys. He's crawling to the end. Oh, it was that he's was. He's got tough. no hand. He's got no legs. Yeah. He's like, oh, let me in. Oh. Well, that was that was I thought really horrifying and and really well executed. I thought that was a great sequence. And I Which also... they also did in frequency. <laughs> <laughs> See? Uh, but but it was well executed. It was very well, and he was well executed. He, he was well executed, <laughs> which they also did in Hannibal. Yeah, that's right. Um, so uh, the the other piece that that uh, that I thought was great was then when Bruce Willis is in the alley uh, and, and watching the... Mm young Joe escape and they're hiding behind separate cars and you can kind of see him becoming aware of the experience of JGL as he's becoming aware of it you know the a concept which they, which they explain later in the diner uh, you know about the cloudy memories that become uh, you know focused as soon as they happen right uh, I thought I thought that was a, a an interesting execution on the time travel conceit yeah I thought that was great and it actually made perfect sense it's that yeah. It kind of reminded me of oddly of Men in Black Three with that um, character, and I can't remember the actor's name, who played that being who the multi-dimensional being all the different all the different potential futures, right? Yep. Um, and it's like that sort of life, except instead of being able to see all the different potential futures, he can only see kind of this vague idea. I mean, he can see what he remembers as his future, but then everything else is kind of cloudy, and even his own future is kind of cloudy, Mm -hmm. except everything from here at this point back is crisp. Right. So right. it was it was pretty interesting. I really liked that. And and when he opens, when older uh, Joe opens his his pocket watch and looks at the picture the picture of his wife and says, first time I saw her face, first time I saw her face," you know, trying to fight that memory from leaving his mind. Yeah. I thought that was uh, uh, I thought that was a, a a nice moment. And they didn't go overboard on moments like that. They didn't go overboard on you know now we're going to be in your mind and it's going to be full of smoke and you know you right. you know that they could have uh, you know Johnson could have taken some really uh, uh, dramatic uh, effects turns on those mm-hmm. sorts of moments and he really didn't. And in fact the the uh, I thought the the dismemberment of the older Seth was was done with uh, uh, an air of great restraint. You know, I mean it could have mm-hmm. really it was just once his nose was there and then it wasn't, but it was all done with cutaways and I thought that was really well done. Yeah, I agree. The um um, what was the other thing I was going to say? Oh, regarding that, and just kind of the uh, the way that he played those characters, I also really liked how both versions of Joe, in their own way, have this very selfish attitude. And I liked how 
as much as we like the young Joe, you know, the whole save the cat thing, we just, he's a likable guy. He, we, we seem to, we see him as a young guy and we kind of attach ourselves to him, but he kind of is selfish. And as he's talking to the older Joe, he's just like, screw it. I'm just going to kill you so I can get in the right with these guys and I can keep collecting my money. Cause this is just, you know, cause this is my life we're talking about. You know, that whole thing. I liked how, they really focused on playing those characters. What I felt was was not necessarily in a way that made one of them more likable than the other. They both kind of had kind of this um, unlikable quality in that they were both in it for themselves at that point. And it's not until that end where he finally realizes what he has to do to not be doing that. And I, I loved that character arc that we have with him over the course of the film. Yeah, you just made a, a, a cool connection for me, which I think is uh, that that was. That's really neat. That um, what we see in older Joe is the you know the older, wiser, the guy who has learned the lessons that that mm -hmm. come from greed and the dark places that it can take you. And now his primary motivation is love, and he does yeah. horrible things for love because he loves right. you know his wife and he's given. And younger Joe is out for greed still. He hasn't learned those lessons um, until he meets Emily Blunt and he realizes that he can exist for something greater and he j decides not to kill Sid even though he also knows. And finally when he has that moment of awareness and realizes you know I, I'm going to do this for, for a higher reason mm -hmm. than greed. I need to take my own life. I need to be the guy who, who you know steps Closes, in front of a yeah. bullet and closes this loop. Right. Yeah, that's a that is you're right. That is a a really powerful parallel. Um, yeah. It is that is executed really well by again my extraordinarily high opinion of J. G. Allen Bruce Willis. <laughs> well, yeah, but also you have to give some of that to the script because I think a lot of that is how those characters are written in the script yeah. and how those relationships form over the course of the script. Yeah. So I mean, you got to give Johnson credit for that. As great as those performances are. No, I do. I, I do. You know, you're right. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. He's totally on my list. Like yeah. I, Ryan Johnson is one of my very favorites, and and he has not done. Uh, I, I I feel like he's one of those directors. I feel really lucky to be a contemporary of, mm -hmm. uh, because I think he is going to do some really great stuff. Uh, Ryan yeah. Johnson, Christopher Nolan. I mean, we're really lucky that uh, to to be hanging with these guys who are. Who we yeah. get to we get to watch and and so, um, you know, this was a hard movie to make and a hard movie to wrap your head around uh, to make a movie like this. So they, they this it's it's worth seeing. I, I wish it was even more. So it's still a movie you like? Oh yeah 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 yeah. No, don't get me wrong. I mean, there's a lot going on that was that was solid. This movie. I just like I said, that's the that's the curse of the near miss, right? I mean, it's the curse of yeah. the movie that you really desperately want to love. Well, and, and, and like we said a couple weeks ago, I mean, this is it's really how I felt about Big Fish, and I think that's what was so frustrating for me with Big Fish is that it's a movie I wanted to like so badly, and I still want to like so badly, and I just always feel like it's just slightly missing. Uh, missing everything, and so yeah, I mean, I can I can totally understand your point. I can totally understand it. All right. And I'm curious. I'm curious. Give it another year or so. Give it a, a bunch. Of, you know, a number of more watches of the film. I'm curious to see where we land with this one. I, you know, I am too. And that's one of the you know the curse of of hindsight that we don't actually have here. Yeah. Um, uh, that. Uh, yeah, it's it's just so fresh. It, it needs to age. Yeah. Uh, so uh, let's see. Last. Uh, the the last thing I want to say is the bu the budget that I I uh, I dug up on this movie was thirty million so That's far reported. Is that thirty million and and as of yesterday they were just under seven million uh, domestically that they uh, brought in so they're looking at pushing twenty million or so over the weekend and it looks like it's probably going to come in number two behind Hotel Transylvania. Um, I guess you could say predictably. I, I don't know if I'm as excited about seeing Hotel Transylvania, although I know my daughter is dying to see it. So, mm. yeah, I'm not as I'm I'm not excited about that one. But that's a you know it's a different movie. I I uh, no this you know I think this movie it deserves to be seen. It definitely does. Yeah, it definitely does. Uh, so, what is our what's our next uh, hangout chat? Because uh, you know next time we're you know everybody's going to be around. 
I think we're still on hold trying to determine if it's going to be Argo or if it's going to be Cloud Atlas. When does Cloud Atlas hit? Uh, the end of October. I want to say the 27th. I don't have the uh, schedule in front of me. Let me look and see. Um, but Argo, I think, is like the 13th or so. Right. And Cloud Atlas is the 26th. Yeah. Cloud Atlas the 26th, and then we have Skyfall uh, November 9th. Right. So we're so gonna. I think we're gonna do them all, and uh, well, we'll see how that works. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll we'll play that by ear. We'll play that by ear. All right. Well, uh, where uh, where are you? Are you? Do you have any more things on your list? Are you gonna do that? Today? I don't. I think I think we managed to know. Actually, we hit everything. So uh, we right. did, we um, and I had my budget pages open. We hit that. Yeah, we we covered it all. All so. right. Good news. All right, my friend, where can people find you when they want to talk to you some more? Uh, Facebook um, at Soda Creek Film or Twitter at Soda Creek Film, and as always at uh, rashpixel.tv slash MWL. Absolutely. Uh, you can find me at Pete Wright on the Twitter and Facebook.com slash Pete Wright or uh, obviously movies we like. And uh, yeah. Uh, we gotta get. I got. I gotta get better about posting all this stuff on Google Plus. We have the Google Plus uh, thing, and I. I don't. Um, yeah, yeah, they just they they haven't made it convenient yet, where you can't say Google Plus or Google dot com slash movies we like. Yeah, it's, it's still it's still like this giant code of letters and numbers that don't help. Well, you know what I did actually. If you go to rashpixel dot com slash plus, I have that redirecting to my. Google Plus page. We, I, really, we, I just need to do that for Rash Pixel uh, for the, all of our properties. I will yeah. do that. That I will do. I'll take care of that. I know how to go. put those wires together. Uh, so thanks, folks, for joining us for this conversation. And we will, uh, we, you know, keep watching the Facebook page in particular. We'll let you know when the next Hangout is. And it'll be sometime in October. And the whole crew will be here. I Indeed. guarantee it. Indeed. All right. Thanks, Andy. <laughs> good night. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. You too.